God. The earth, the moon, the sun, the stars, the oceans, the mountains, the trees that grow beside the waters, the animals that come to the stream to drink. It's all your work. You have created it. You gave us the sun which marks the days and the moon that marks the months. It all fits together like the workings of a clock. Then you gave us the ability to care for it all. You gave us the chance to care for each other. There is so much work to do, God. Help us to remember we do the work for you. If we cook, let us cook as though your son will be a guest at the table. If we paint, let us paint as though the picture will hang in your house. If we clean, let us clean as if your angels are coming to our home to dance. We will keep you in mind, God, in all things, in all we do. When we labor and when we rest, you created and you took a break. We will take this day and stop. We will breathe. We will appreciate the gifts you have given us. Our hands, our feet, our minds, our hearts. We will look around and see our lives as a gift. We will be grateful for the jobs we have. We will pray for those who cannot find work. We will reach out a hand to help those who cannot help themselves. We will be grateful for this day, this moment set aside to say thank you to the one who began a good work and continues that work in us. Amen. On this Labor Day weekend, I give thanks for the calling that God, God has given to each of us. <laughs> and may God bless you and your callings as we come together and remember that our calling comes in our baptism. As we share together today in this Labor Day weekend, some words from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In a speech that he gave in 1956, reminded me of the prayer that we just watched together. And it was a speech that he shared facing the challenges of a new day. Dr. King said, whatever your life's work is, do it well even if it does not fall in the category of one of the so-called big professions. Do it well. As one college professor said, a person should do their job so well that the living, the dead, and the unborn could not do it better. If it falls to your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures, like Shakespeare wrote poetry, like Beethoven composed music, Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept their job well. May we all work together so that we can do our jobs well and become united. Again, I greet you this morning at San Diego United Methodist Church. Today, one who teaches us about we're continuing on and to follow our calling. We're blessed to have the Reverend Dr. Faith J. Conklin sharing our message today. Would you join me now in song? Dreaming. 
Good morning, everyone. I know that some of you are starting school and starting your activities up again, and the world might feel a little bit overwhelming. Maybe it even feels a little bit scary. And so maybe you're wondering some ways that you can find some comfort and peace. Well, I found this book and it is called The Peace Book, and I think it can give us some good ideas on where we can find peace. Peace is making new friends. Peace is keeping the water blue for all the fish. Peace is saying you're sorry when you hurt someone. Peace is helping your neighbor. Peace is giving shoes to someone who needs them. Peace is reading all different kinds of books. Peace is thinking about someone you love. Peace is being free. Peace is learning another language. Peace is watching it snow. Peace is keeping the streets clean. Peace is offering a hug to a friend. Peace is everyone having a home. Peace is taking a nap. Peace is sharing a meal. Peace is wishing on a star. Peace is being who you are. So as the school year starts and you're looking for some ways to find some peace, I hope you will remember some of these, these ways to find peace. And also remember that you can always talk to God to help bring you peace and, and find your peace. So this week I want you to especially remember if you're feeling scared or overwhelmed or about to start something new, that you can always talk to God and find your peace. Let us pray together. Dear God, we thank you for loving us and for giving us ways that we can find peace. As we go about our week, we pray that if we're feeling overwhelmed or scared, that we would just be reminded that we can always talk to you and that you will bring us your comfort and peace. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Have a great week. Again, I want to just welcome you with us in worship this morning. As we come into this Labor Day weekend, I do want to give thanks, um, especially as we work together here, to not only those who are speaking and those who are singing, but also to those on our audiovisual team working, to Sarah playing, and to the many others in our church, the trustees, the finance, the staff team, human relations, missions. So many people work together, and in the midst of the life that we're living at, at this time, they continue to work and help to build the body of Christ. And as I think about that body of Christ reaching out to others, I think of our care team, and I want to give thanks for the care team that we have. And if there's anything that you need along the way, if you can email Lynn Cockins, uh, she'll help you out with those needs and direct you to the person who can help you. Also, as we come into this time, we're doing some new work um, around here, a uh, new worship experience, uh, which we're calling Virch. So you can check the, um, the website, if you will, thetablesd.org. And if you go to that, you can see some new worship experiences that we're sharing with others in our community and, and really around this globe. Also, as we come to worship next week, We'll share in uh, communion, and it'll be our communion Sunday, our share the table Sunday, but we'll also begin something new, and it's our outdoor worship service, which will be an in-person service following the live stream. We'll still continue the live stream on for ever and ever, if you will, but at this time, next Sunday, we'll start 1045, an in-person gathering in the back patio outside. Please uh, watch your Wednesday e-news for 
uh, ways to sign up, and more information about this service. Also, as we come into the months ahead that sometimes are a bit busy, they'll still have a number of ministries and events, although maybe in some different ways. Tomorrow, we'll start a 40-day prayer vigil and just continue to pray for the world around us. So if you're interested in being part of that, please email us at info at and I'll share the prayers with you on Tuesday morning, and we'll begin to pray together. The Lord's uh, Prayer Bible Study uh, by Dr. Michael Lodal, a professor at Point Loma, will start on September 29th. It's a Tuesday at 11 a.m., so you can sign up again at the info email. As I shared with you, Communion Sunday is next week, and Share the Table Sunday. And if you can continue to watch for bins um, on the campus, we'll have a bin where food is needed for the food banks around the area. So watch for what's needed and drop them off at the bins during the weekdays and on Sundays. Lastly, next Sunday will be a blessing of the shoes. This year, instead of backpacks, as we have a lot of distance learning, We've heard from the school districts around the area that children are in need of shoes. So I hope that you would either look at the e-news following um, that you'll receive today or also uh, pick up a pair of shoes and drop them off at the church office so that we can provide shoes for those who may be underserved within the area around us. As always, I want to thank you for just being a congregation that gives and gives in so many different ways. And part of our calling, part of the work as we think on this Labor Day weekend are our prayers, our presence, our service, our witness, and our gifts. So let us find and ponder ways that we can give back to God for all that we have been given at this time.
celebrate this Labor Day weekend, our gospel text from Matthew reminds us of the kingdom work to which each of us is called. We are the priesthood of all believers. We are bridge builders and reconcilers. We are those who proclaim God's word of truth, justice, grace, and forgiveness. We are those called to do God's works of love. And Matthew here offers us a strategy as to how to do that, one that promotes both community and true peace. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have gained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two or three of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of the God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, may these words from my mouth and these meditations of our hearts find us faithful. And may your word take root in our lives that we may serve you each day in ways that are pleasing to you. Amen. My daughter, CJ, works at Whittier United Methodist Church she shared this story with me. A brother and his younger sister were playing together in the nursery, and they got into a dispute over something. The staff took the boy to another room, and the little girl could hear him having fun on the other side. After a few moments, she started to walk across the hall, and then she stopped at the door. What's the matter, asked her teacher. And she looked up and she replied, I can't go in there. I forgot. I'm mad at him. It's not just children. We get angry, shut the doors of our hearts and refuse to open them. We remember and rehearse grudges, not letting them go. We shout and try desperately to get another to see it our way. We condemn, even criminalize them when they don't. We draw lines, and we dare others to cross them. I've known churches that divided and lost members over what color to paint the sanctuary, who should use the kitchen, if the pastor should wear a robe, whether community groups can use the facilities or if they could share space with another ethnic group. Congregations have crucified one another over how to spend a bequest, when to change a pastor, what music to sing, or how to serve communion. Bitter conflicts occur over larger issues as well. Can a Christian support the death penalty? Is abortion ever a Christian stance? Should LGBTQ plus persons be ordained? What about same-sex marriage? Is war ever moral? How generous an immigration policy should we establish? Is wearing a mask a political or a health statement? Are protests a legitimate way to speak out against injustice? And the more passionately that we hold our convictions, the harder it is to listen to another's. The tragedy isn't that we disagree about these things. 
The tragedy is that we let these disagreements shatter our community. We let them damage our witness in the world. We stop discussing and we start demanding. And being right takes precedence over being in relationship. Jesus knew how hard it is to live with each other in authentic community. He also saw it as the work to which each of us is called. And in our increasingly divided, conflicted, and shattered society, that work is even more necessary. And in today's text, he offers a strategy for keeping relationships whole. One might call it a primer in how Christians are to fight. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen to even to the church, let that one be as a Gentile and a tax collector. This is one of Jesus' more practical teachings. It's not a parable. It's not a promise. It's not a prophecy. It's a straightforward piece of advice. It's also a profound and powerful theology of gracious love. It's grounded in Jesus' understanding of who God is and what that means for how we live with one another. If you have a problem with another church member, take the initiative. Go to the person privately and try to mend the break. If that fails, take two or three others with you and talk it out again. If the problem still isn't resolved and the relationship repaired, then share it with the wider community. It's good advice for our life in the church. It's also good advice for all our relationships, in our families, in work, school, in the community, and in the world. If you have a problem, try to talk it out and come to some agreement. Seek the help of trusted friends. Remember who and whose you are. Act like it. Now, most of us, me included, don't like confrontation. We see it negatively. And that can be unhelpful because the literal meaning of that word confrontation is to come together face to face. Come together face to face. We don't talk behind another's back. We don't say things to others that we wouldn't say to the person about whom we're talking. If there's a question, we ask rather than assume. We don't withdraw from the relationship because we're angry, offended, or upset. We don't privately nurse our bitterness or rehearse our grudges. We meet face to face. We talk to the person, not about the person. We listen. The church has often been likened to a family. Show me a family where there's no disagreement or struggle, and I'll bet that it's a family that's not really talking to one another about anything important. As members of Christ's family, we frequently hold different views of what's right, what's needed, and how things should be done. We're to let Christ's view of us hold us together beyond those differences and in spite of them. And so we discuss, we argue, we struggle. But in the midst of it, we strive to embrace one another as members of Christ's body and to see each other in all ways as beloved children of God. 
Barbara Brown Taylor, one of my favorite authors, says it this way, our life together is the chief means God has chosen for being with us. And it is of ultimate importance to God. Our life together is the place where we are comforted, confronted, tested, and redeemed by God through one another. It is the place where we come to know God or flee from God's presence, depending upon how we come to know or flee from one another. Our life together is important. In our life together, God meets us. And that means in that life together, we keep looking for common ground. We keep asking, what's the goal? What do we really want to happen? We keep the conversations open. We look beyond ourselves and seek to discern God's greater will. We practice Jesus' command to love one another as God has loved us. And even as we struggle, we ask ourselves, what does my relationship with Jesus call me to do to preserve the relationship with my brothers and sisters? What does my relationship with Jesus call me to do so I can preserve the relationship with my brothers and sisters? Will this build our life together or will it tear it down? Jesus' final instruction is strange. When we've tried and the relationship still isn't mended, he says, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, usually that's interpreted, let it go. Stop trying. Have no more to do with that person. I remind you, Matthew wrote this gospel. He was a tax collector. He knew Jesus died for Gentiles, tax collectors, and every kind of sinner, even us. Jesus was criticized and condemned because he ate with those sinners and tax collectors. To treat someone as a Gentile and a tax collector doesn't mean rejecting them. It means allowing space to be and disagree without condemnation. It means continuing to hold open the possibility that there might be a renewed relationship. It sets a boundary, but that boundary is defined by love. And it's not about our love for them. It's about God's love for all of us a love that never lets go. Frederick Buechner points to this truth saying, for Jesus, peace seems to have meant not the absence of struggle, but the presence of love. We live by the promise that Christ is with us. We discuss, we discern, but we don't give up on one another. We trust God to do what we can't, to bring us together when we seem so far apart. And in the unlikely, seemingly impossible places, we trust God's love to find a way to reach us and bring us into community. Father Greg Boyle is one person who shows me where life, hope, faith, and God intersect in some of those impossible places. He's the founder of Homeboy Industries, the largest gang intervention program in the world. I had the privilege of being with him at a community-hosted event at the Escondido Church. And along with Dana and Brandon Black and a few others, we had dinner prior 
to his speech. His joy in his work, his trust in God's grace is as genuine as his stories. And his books, Tattoos on the Heart and Barking to the Choir, show us how out of brokenness comes wholeness, how barriers become open doors, lines turn into circles, and hope emerges out of despair. One story from Father Boyle begins with these words. The answer to every question is compassion. The answer to every question is compassion. Sometimes compassion is hard won. Sometimes it even looks like a defeat before it becomes a victory. And that's so in this story of Clever and Trevisio. As Father Boyle writes, Clever seems eager to begin at Homeboy Silkscreen. At 22 years old, he has assured me he's ready to retire his jersey from the barrio. And he moves with me easily through the factory, shaking hands cheerfully with those printing shirts. Even enemies he greets and looks them in the eye until he turns a corner and sees Trevisio, a 24-year-old from an enemy hood. In unison, they stare instantly at their feet. Some mumbling takes place, and there is a great mutual shifting of body weight. They do not shake hands. I discover sometime later that the hatred they hold for each other is profundo. Something has transpired between them, and the breach is beyond repair. Their eyes are still epoxied to their Nike Cortezes. Look, I tell them, if you can't hang working together, please let me know that now. I got lots of homies who'd love to have this job. They say nothing, so that's that. Some six months later, Trevisio finds himself surrounded in an alley, greatly outnumbered by members of an enemy gang who beat him badly. While he is lying there, they will not stop kicking his head until he is still and lifeless. And then they leave him. Someone gets him to White Memorial Hospital where he's declared brain dead and left on life support. The doctors wait 48 hours to secure a flat read, and then they can officially declare him deceased. I'm speaking at St. Louis University, and I fly home. I've seen a great deal of horrifying things in my lifetime. Nothing, however, compares to the sight of this kid, a wonderfully gentle-souled kid, with his head swollen many times its size. And I can barely keep my eyes trained on him as I smear sacred oil on his forehead and we say goodbye in the pull of a plug. In those 24 hours after his death, I am in my office late at night and the phone rings. It's clever. Hey, he begins awkwardly, that, that's, that's messed up about, about, about what happened to Trevisio, yeah, it is, I say to him. Is there anything I can do, Clever asks? Can I give him my blood? This last offer sucks the breathable air out of the atmosphere for both of us. We can fail each of us tremble in silence. Clever takes the lead and he punctures the quiet with great resolve and unprotected tears. He was not my enemy. He was my friend. We worked together. And Father Boyle concludes, close both eyes, see with the other one. Then we are no longer saddled by the burden of our persistent judgments, our ceaseless withholding, our constant exclusion. 
Our sphere has widened. And we find ourselves quite unexpectedly in a new expansive location, in a place of endless acceptance and infinite love. We've wandered into God's own jurisdiction. God's infinite love embraces us all. And in that holy embrace, we find our place, our center, our reality. Held there, even in our fighting, we find new ways to come together. Enemies become friends. Shut hearts are opened. We enter God's jurisdiction. And in our fighting, we witness to a new way of being, a new dimension of love. Make it so. Amen. I want to thank Reverend Faith for her continued work and bringing us inspiring and powerful messages. So may it be so for all of us. I also want to thank uh, the choir and Sarah Amos, Dr. Scott Bowen for their work as they continue to bring us virtual anthems, hymns during this time. So let us now come prayerfully together, work together, praying together as we hear the words to their great hymn, Ferris Lord Jesus.
let us pray together. Almighty God, when you formed us lovingly out of the dust of the earth, you breathed into us the breath of life and gave us work and purpose for living. Through our work, you make us co-creators with you, shaping the world in which we live. You gave dignity to our labor by sending your son to labor with us. By our labor, you enrich the world. By our labor, we enjoy the fruits of creation and find direction and purpose. For providing varieties of work and for blessing us by our labor, we give you thanks, O Lord. For those who plow the field and those who make the plow, for those who work with their hands and those who move the earth, we give you thanks, O Lord. For those who tend the sick and those who seek new cures, for those who think and those who create, we give you thanks, O Lord. For those who work in offices and those who work in warehouses, for those who inspire our minds and those who motivate us, for those who help the poor and those who work with our children, we give you thanks, O Lord. You bless us all with skills and gifts for labor. You provide us opportunities to use them for the benefit of others as well as ourselves. Guard and protect those who labor in the world. Bless the work of our hands, O Lord. Look kindly on the unemployed. Give health to the sick and hope to those who are grieving. Keep us from working only for greed. Make, it, make us loving and responsible in all that we do. Creator God, you are the source of all wisdom and purpose. You are the blessing of those who labor. Be with us, O God. Give us all work that enhances human dignity and binds us to one another. Give us pride in our work, a fair return on our labor, and joy in knowing that our work finds its source in you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come to a close. We have a special hymn to end with, Crown Him with Many Crowns. It comes to us by the Carlsbad High School Brass Quintet. We shared it in the spring, but we wanted to share it again. As you think and pray for the students who are doing distance learning, especially those musicians. And we want to thank Peter Manzi, a member of this church, also the director of the band at Carlsbad High School. And so in honor of these young men who put together this special hymn for us, I'd ask you to think again about the students who are underserved in our communities, and may you think about offering a pair of shoes to help those in our community. So now let us joyfully come together and hear this great hymn.
Receive now the benediction. Close both eyes. See with the other one. Remember who and whose you are. Let God's love be your center. Practice peace. Promote justice. Be blessed. Bring blessing. Amen. Amen. Thank you.